is Eric Conner. I'm an instructor here, and it's a happy privilege to uh, bring out tonight's special guest, Seth Rogen. Um, how many of you guys have seen Freaks and Geeks? All right, now how many of you have not? I like, you see, there's embarrassment, as there should be. When you watch Freaks and Geeks, what you're gonna see is one of the best portrayals of high school ever in TV or film. You're also gonna see what was basically Seth Rogen's college film school experience. Uh, he came down here from Vancouver and he hit the ground running. He basically got to work with Judd Apatow, with James Franco, with basically his family of filmmakers, actors, writers that have been part of this sort of Seth Rogen family ever since. And then all his talent went on, not just to act more, but to write. The next show, Undeclared, terrific TV show about college, Judd Apatow producer. And Seth Rogen went not just as an actor into that show, but also as a writer before he was even 21, I believe. Um, and from there, his career has just continued to grow. As a writer, we have seen his work for years now. Super bad. Pineapple Express. Yeah! This is the end. Yeah! And as he's grown too, it's, what I think is amazing is Hollywood kind of changed with him, grew with him. Suddenly he's a leading man, knocked up. You go from there and he has continued to grow as a producer, as a writer. How many of you guys have watched Preacher? Just that guy, but he's very excited, Seth. He is very excited for you. Um, his work as a, pr a writer, producer, actor is amazing. And then, of course, he's got more stuff down the pipeline. How many of you guys have seen The Room, the great cult film? One person who's slightly embarrassed, like me. Well, I made up for it. I saw it 10 times. The masterpiece coming out with James Franco directing it. His work is incredible. It touches everyone. It reaches audiences. It's not just for kids. And then we got Sausage Party, which is definitely not for kids. And the reason I know is because I have a five-year-old who I had to explain to what an R rating means. And it's good that he didn't find a way to sneak in, because then he would be afraid of tacos and sausages and bread and lavish and bagel. And he would wonder why mustard hates our people, which I don't believe it does. Um, but I know five years from now, he will steal my Blu-ray copy, and him and his friends will love this movie as much as we all did. So. Let's bring the wonderful writer, producer, director, actor to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Seth Rogen! What are you excited about? The guy who ruined all your barbecues from now on. <laughs> Is that some Canadian revenge act? No, think? not at all. Eric basically told your whole uh, biography, yeah. so now yeah. you basically ruined my first question. I know, he said a lot of nice things. That was, <laughs> it made me feel very old hearing all that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah. I don't fucking know. Yeah. <laughs> How did you come up with this uh, very clever, very filthy uh, idea for a movie? Um, it was <laughs> partially how you'd think and partially not how you'd think, I guess. Uh, it was... <laughs> It was largely due to, honestly, a love of like Pixar movies. Like when I was around your age is when like the Pixar movies started to come out and um, be really popular. And, and we just love them and we're like obsessed with them and thought they were like the most consistent, high quality filmmaking that was kind of happening in a lot of ways. And so we were like, let's do a really fucked up version of that. And then, um, and then for years we would just kick around ideas and this idea of like food in a grocery store kind of slowly became uh, the idea that we then worked on. We, we came up with the idea like 10 years ago, like in 2006, and then we wrote it for like three years and then we tried to sell it for three years and then we've been making it for the last like three and a half years basically yeah okay so um you wrote it with uh, your writing partner 
right? Yeah, I wrote it with uh, me and Jonah Hill and Evan Goldberg, my partner, originally came up with the idea, and then I wrote it with Kyle Hunter and Ariel Shafir, who are two guys who I also grew up with, who wrote the night before with uh, with Evan and John Levine, and who have been producers on our movie since Fifty Fifty, and they were producers on This Is the End and um, the interview and the night before, and they we they're just people we have on set to write. Uh, jokes for us and make sure the scenes make sense and shit like that basically we have as much help as we can get yeah so you basically work with people that you met in your early days and in school and so on and so forth mostly yeah um most of the people i work with i've known since yeah like before i was 20 years old um like judd and franco and Jason Siegel and uh, Martin Starr and Jay Baruchel and, um, you know, a lot of the writers and directors I work with still. Nick Stoller, who directs the Neighbors movies, was a writer on Undeclared, so I've known him since I was 18. And um, I met Evan in bar mitzvah class, so I've known him since I was uh, 12. I met Ariel, one of the guy who we co-wrote this with at summer camp. Um, I met Kyle at home, in, home at class in eighth grade. <laughs> um, and so... And we all wanted to be writers, and so we just kept working together over the years. Um, yeah, and even a lot of the people in the movie I've known for a really long time. Danny and Craig and Kroll I've known forever, and Bill, and um, I mean, that's the only way you get people to do that. <laughs> <laughs> As if you've known them for like over 15 years. <laughs> so many of the best comedians that... Um we're here over the decades, basically came from Canada. Yeah. What gives? What did they feed you over there? <laughs> um, what I honestly think it is, is because I've also worked with like British comedians before and they're hilarious, but they don't quite understand like American culture to the degree they probably need to in order to like really infiltrate it. You know what I mean? Um, but Canadians grow up with American culture, but it's not our culture. So we view it as though it's like this other thing, kind of. But we know it all. We get, you know, the grind, all that MTV shit I grew up watching. You know, it's just you didn't, you probably, that you're too young. It was like people dancing on a beach, literally. But anyway, um, so we grew up with all this American shit, but we didn't view it as our shit. And so we probably were a little more inclined to make fun of it well and to comment on it well because I think when you're like outside of something, you're in a slightly better position to comment on it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think that's why a lot of Canadians do well in American comedy because they comment well on American culture um, while not, and it's not their culture, so they're not as, you know, attached to it. They're, they're a little more objective about it, I guess. Makes sense. Yeah. And how did you start in the business? I started doing stand-up comedy when I was 13 years old. And then I, through that, got an agent. And then through that, auditioned for Freaks and Geeks when I was like 16. And then moved here to LA when I was 17, which was 18 years ago. Um, and have literally been working with the same people ever since then, basically. And I've been just with James Franco ever since. <laughs> I, just, I haven't looked back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to open up for the student because I know they're anxious to ask you questions. So line up, please. While they're doing that, I wanted to ask you one last question. Yeah. Between you and Judd Apatow, you really... Um, made raunch a genre. <laughs> I don't, I, we can't take responsibility for that. <laughs> I no, wish we could. but it's true. Yeah. It's true. It's kind of, it shifted the pa parameters of uh, broad comedy, I, I think. I, I, maybe. I, I think, like, because I, like, to me, like, there's something about Mary, honestly, it was one of those movies that I watched in high school. And, I, and to me, that shifted the parameters of comedy. And then the South Park movie came out when I was in high school. And like, I'll never forget the moment when Saddam Hussein pulls his dick out. And like, it was like, it was like one of those moments where you're like, oh wow, like, movies can be so much more than I thought they could be. Like, it was like the most shocking thing I'd ever, I, it was, I could not believe what I was seeing. And, um, and so, 
like, I don't think that we, we're standing on the dicks of giants. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you have to follow that with a question. <laughs> uh, Nora, yes, I am. When you were starting out in comedy, what did you do to block out negative responses from agents and casting directors who just didn't fucking get your humor? Yeah. Honestly, that's gotten harder as I've gotten older. Like yeah. when I was younger, I didn't give a shit. I like was so confident <laughs> and like I was like 18 and 19 when I moved to LA and I was just like, fuck everyone. They're wrong. I'm right. Ah. <laughs> like I just like I was really aggressive and confident and and it's over the years as I've read like thousands of articles just saying what an idiot I am. I'm like, fuck, maybe I should just stop. But like <laughs> that, you know, it, it, when I was younger, honestly, it, it, I, it, I look back and honestly marvel at how little I thought about whether or not other people thought I was funny when I was first starting. It was all, I think I'm good at this. I'm just going to do it. And I think I can do something different in movies. So I'm just going to try to write movies. And, um, and almost the more I didn't succeed, I was very angry. I would get bitter and angry a lot, but I just was like, the more I didn't succeed, I would just be like, get more angry and try even harder to do my shit. Like super, I mean, this movie, like, we've been trying to make it for 10 years and like we were successful when that happened. Like it's not like, like when we tried to make it was like after, you know, pineapple express and super bad and all of like our big hit movies had come out and still nobody wanted to fucking make it. <laughs> and so we just, whenever that happens, you just have to, you know, really make sure that it's a good idea and that, and that's by trusting the people around you and making sure you've surrounded yourself by people who will, be honest with you and give you good constructive criticism. And if the consensus is it's a good idea, then you just do it until it occurs. Um, and you do other things meanwhile. Like we made like six movies that aren't as good as this while we were trying to make this. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you got to keep going just in some way. But the whole time we were trying to make this as well. Um, just never stop. Fuck them. That's the idea, I guess. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dustin Ardeen. I'm in the acting program here. Cool. I can kind of answer like four programs questions, which is kind of a unique position. Elia <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kazan once said that he believed every actor gets their shot eventually, but it's a matter of will you be ready when you when you get it? And what would you say to older actors who haven't gotten their shot yet? I'd say Ian McKellen became famous when he was like 80. Um, <laughs> like... <laughs> I always think that. And then he probably got to fuck the best dudes after that. I also think. Like, <laughs> like the turn of guys Ian McKellen was able to fuck was, was drastic after, you know, the first X-Men film, I imagine. And he deserves it because he worked his ass off for years and years and years. Um, that's what I always think, honestly, is that there's so many actors that just kind of keep going and um, that don't quit and that there's actors who literally don't become famous until they're in their like 50s and 60s and 70s sometimes. And, you know, um, and in the meantime, I think, you know, they, they do other stuff and they keep working in smaller roles, but uh, they don't get their break until they're much older sometimes. And if you're only an actor and can't write for yourself or create your own material otherwise, then... I always just tell you people like then become friends with the writer because they always need actors for their shit and become friends with the director because they always need actors for their shit. And and so just uh, just link up with someone who has a job you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You don't have to clap after everyone. It's OK. <laughs> I, feel, I, I feel good. <laughs> um, as a producer, how do you finance your films? Do do. Like, do you do studio studio deals or do you finance them your own? Um, we've made uh, we've made movies very different ways, um, spanning from like the most studio of ways to the most independent of ways. Um, 
And, you know, it, part of, you know, what we think is like a big part of the question is like budgeting the movies properly. Like we've never had the philosophy that we should just get like as much money for every movie as humanly possible. We'll look at the movie and think like realistically, how much does a movie like this make? We probably shouldn't make it for that much more than that because we just don't want to, we want to keep making movies. So um, if the movie's a weirder idea, like 50, 50 is an example of a movie that we made on completely independently, but then we sold it to a studio before it came out. Um, so that was one way. It's all different. Uh, they all have their ups and downs. Um, I have never like financed a movie myself that we've made. I've put money into our movies for little things here and there. Sometimes you can't afford a song you want or you can't afford all the visual effects you think you want and stuff like that. Um, and I've done that, but I've never like fully like paid for something because other assholes are willing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm A.B. Cohen. I'm an actor in the acting program. Thanks for taking the time. I just wanted to ask you if you could go back to when you were 13 years old doing your first steps into stand up and you could only give yourself one piece of advice, what would you say to yourself? Um, I wouldn't say anything, just in case I fucked it up, man. Like, as a, <laughs> like, as a fan of time travel movies, I know that that would change things. Um, so I would hide and just try not to sit on anything or step on anything uh, that would adversely affect the future version of me. That's what I would do. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and I would kill baby Hitler. No. <laughs> for the tribe, for the tribe. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what would you say is the most difficult part of your profession? Uh, which one? Like, of just being making movies in general, I guess? Yeah, like acting, writing, just like everything. Um... For me personally, or like for the general person, I guess. Uh, I guess for you. Uh, yeah. For me, yeah, sure. Yeah. I guess. Um, <laughs> to me, the releasing of the movies is always the most stressful time because it's the part that one generally has the least control over. Um, you know, you never know how much they spend. Like, you know how much the movie cost to make that you have a million conversations over, but there's literally never one conversation where like a number is said in regards to marketing budgets. They never say a number ever. I have no fucking clue how much they spend at all. And so that's one thing. And the other thing is you, unless you have a very good relationship with the studio, you generally don't have as much input into like what the commercials and trailers are like as you do the other steps of the filmmaking process and so because of those like two major wild cards for me it's the most stressful part because you know we've spent years working so in every other element we have as much control over as humanly possible over every element and then when it comes to actually releasing the movies there's like two massive things we have like very little control over so because of that that's to me the part that I get the most stressed out about in general because, again, it's the part I control the least, and so I like it the least. <laughs> right on, cool. Thank nice, you. thanks. Cheers. Look at this guy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Seth? Uh, nice, dude. Jake Johnson. Um, yeah, that's the was, name of a. Uh, yeah. You said you said it took ten years to make the movie. What was the hardest part of making it? Sausage party. Um, it was, there was a lot of hard parts. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> writing it was not the hardest part, clearly. They, <laughs> these jokes write themselves. Um, uh, no, that was hard. Honestly, it, getting it made was incredibly hard. Finding someone to agree to pay for it was very difficult. Um, it took us literally years and years and years of going on meetings and, being told no by independent financing companies, by major studios, by new people who would come along with money, by every basic way you could be told no is how we were told no. And then someone named Megan Ellison came into existence and she 
like it, it was the coolest person ever and basically like made it her thing to like make movies that no one else wanted to make and ours was for sure that and so she uh, co-financed the movie with Sony which is what made them finally agree to do it so that was really difficult um the actual process of making was very difficult we'd never made an animated movie it was very different um than anything we'd done um we realized that it had to be there was a moment in the process where like shit if 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 we're like kind of making fun of a pixar movie it kind of has to be around as smart as a pixar movie and i remember that moment we were like fuck and <laughs> And it really made us, there was a definitive moment like halfway through the process where we realized we had to make the movie significantly better than it seemed like it was going to be. And that was a very difficult time as well. So I think those two things, which both were in the last like six years, were the hardest time. Thanks. Thank you, bro. <laughs> What's up, man? Yo. He literally answered my question, so I'm just Dope. gonna say what up. You just gonna say what up, man? What Dope. up, dude? Dope tats. Have a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Seth. What up? Um. All right. So, do you think this film will open new doors for animated films? Um, I think there's a distinct possibility that if someone was on the fence about making an R-rated animated movie, maybe this nudged them to the other side of it. Uh, hopefully, I know for sure if this movie had been made, it would have been way easier for us to make this movie. And so the next guys who try to make a movie like this will at least be able to say, Sausage Party came out and that was successful, so maybe make our movie. And so... Um, Again, I don't know. We hope to make more R-rated animated movies because this one was fun to work on. Um, but again, it'll probably be 10 years before you see it. <laughs> but uh, I, I really hope that, you know, if anything, this inspires other people to take what, you know, to take this and do something better with it, honestly. And to, you know, if they had an idea that was for an R rated animated movie that maybe even isn't a comedy, maybe it's a horror movie, maybe it's a straight up dramatic movie, then maybe again, this will make it easier. I, I do think this will make it maybe in microscopically easier for those movies to get made, which is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, this guy's got a, you're great at that. Every person. <laughs> New height. Hi, my name's Alexis. I'm in the filmmaking program, Hi. and I have another animation question. Cool. I was wondering what made you dabble in animation if it's something that you were always interested in? Yeah, yeah, I think it really, you know, I grew up watching The Simpsons and South Park and, you know, when, when I was younger, Animaniacs and fucking, you know, uh, just cartoons in general I've always loved. And then when the Pixar movie started to come out, I... I just was blown away by them. Like, they completely, again, not only were visually unlike anything I'd ever seen, but the storytelling and the humor, like, it, you know, it, it was completely like a group of, of, you know, people working at a level that, like, I hadn't seen, you know, in a very long time, if ever. And so that, I think, is what really made us want to do it was was the Pixar movies and just thinking like, well, we'll never be able to do that. And so maybe we can just do our own kind of fucked up, <laughs> like bastard <laughs> version of that. And we'll get like to taste, we'll get to take a sip from the well of glory just for one second. Maybe. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go way up. <laughs> What's up, Don't stop. <laughs> My name's Austin, um, I just had a question. Uh, how are the cast and animation department able to pull off the movie with such a low budget? Uh, what are some of the negative and positive outcomes of working with such a low budget? Um, honestly, like the the cast did it for no money. They all did it for like scale, basically, because um, they Jay, they either were doing us a favor or were excited to just be a part of it or some combination of the two, basically. Um, and and I'm so amazed, honestly, that they did it because it really required a huge amount of trust to do this because it really could have gone south. And so um, that uh, the, it, it, it was just hard because we'd never done it. And I think the reason most of these movies are, you know, six times more expensive than this movie is because they take 
way longer to do them, twice as long, you know, to work on them. And because of that, you can change a lot more on the way. You can look in something and see it's not working and rewrite it. And you can look at something else and see it's not working and rewrite it. We were able to do that a little, but not nearly as much as, as, as I guess you generally are in animated movies. And because of that, it, it, again, like I was saying to the other dude, caused some like very stressful chunks of time as far as, you know, we realized we could make something better and had like hours to figure out how to do it basically before our budget couldn't support it anymore. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go down a bit. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Seth. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, my question is about, um, was there an individual or a movie you watched as a kid that inspired you to go into the film industry and confirming that you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? Um, I think like... My parents were just into movies. Like, they liked movies. They would go to a lot of movies. We had, like, a big VHS collection. And it's funny because we probably had, like, 60 movies in our VHS collection growing up that my parents would, like, tape off of television. So it's funny because lots of them were, like, fucked up, not the right versions of movies. (laughs) Like, I didn't know they smoked weed in the Breakfast Club till like, three years ago because, like, (laughs) my version was... That was edited out for television. Um, But, um... But I really look at the movies that my parents had growing up, and it is like a direct reflection of the stuff that I now make. There was like Woody Allen movies and Robert Zemeckis movies and some incredibly violent, you know, uh, like Paul Verhoeven. My mom was like a huge Paul Verhoeven fan, and she loved Die Hard, and um, she was a big Steven Seagal fan and a big Jean-Claude Van Damme fan, so I was inundated with like incredibly violent movies from a very young age, and and incredibly like intellectual comedic movies from a very young age, um, which um, Uh, I think, and my friends, we just had like a disgusting sensibility. And I think the combination of those three things (laughs) are why I make the types of movies I make. But I I really think it's just because I watched a lot of movies when I was a kid and I loved movies. And I, you know, we would go to Universal Studios when I was a kid and we'd go on the tour. and, and, And in Vancouver, they like, that's where I'm from, they like make movies around. Like it's not you know, you see sets around and I went to a high school where they filmed movies at it sometimes. Blue Diamond Phillips was there once. It was dope. And so, um, (laughs) and so it it was just kind of a thing that I didn't know anyone who worked in the movie business, but it just kind of seemed like maybe it was obtainable. Um, And then I started doing stand-up comedy when I was really, really young and I always thought that was like how I could do it. I was like, I'll become a stand-up comic and then I'll get on like a sitcom like Jerry Seinfeld or something and then from there I'll go in movies you know and that will be my trajectory hopefully um and I wanted to write movies and that's why we started writing super bad when we were like 14 years old basically um and worked on it and it got made when we were like 22 or something like that and so um we started just incredibly young. The second, honestly, and it's funny because it's in Home Alone is one of the movies that made me want to make movies because (laughs) seeing a kid just beat the shit out of adults, there was something about that that really, as a kid who was that age exactly, I found it very, it was like an action movie for kids. And I loved action movies and I was like, I remember thinking, like, I want to make movies like Home Alone. <laughs> and I made this, which is terrible. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. The thieves didn't fuck Kevin. Thank God. <laughs> the wet bandits. Get it? Anyway. Um, it's terrible. Hi, Seth. Hi, uh, sorry. My name is Autumn. Um, on all your films, you work with the same group of people. Um, yeah and they're pretty much your family. Uh, How did you find not only uh, a talented group of people to work with, but people that you click so well with? Uh, I think one kind of came after the other. Like, I met them all through works. So, except the people that I grew up with, Kyle are the people who wrote this movie, basically. Those are the only ones I've known, like, from growing up and being, like, a child. Everyone else I met through work, and what originally drew us together was was each other's work and that was the thing that made us 
like like one another and in some ways and i think beyond that it's what made us take the time to get to know one another and then become personally good friends with one another over the years but it all started i think from you know when you're working it's like it's really hard to do something that feels good a lot of the time sometimes it, and and so when you find people that around whom it feels good you desperately want that you know and you, it's like an insulation like y nothing makes me more secure feeling creatively than seeing basically all the people who are in this movie in close vicinity to me if i'm on set like i feel so much better if jonah or franco or craig or danny are there because i'm just like they are just incredible at their jobs of the hundred things i have to worry about being a producer a writer a director that is not fucking one of them. Like they'll just destroy it. And so, <laughs> and, and in a lot of ways, they're the most visible element of, of the film and, or whatever it is. And so, um, it just is a huge stress. Again, it's just a stress relief. It makes, it makes you not have to worry about it and it makes it really, and, it, and it's really exciting at times. And on top of that, we just like each other. But if I fucking hated these people, I would still work with them all the time, honestly, because they're great at their jobs. And, and I don't think that you have to like everyone. There are some people I don't like that much that I do work with just because they're really, really good at their jobs, but not many, not many. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just a little bit higher. What's up, man? Nate's what up? Montana. Thank nice. you for uh, all the work over the years. And my question is, working with some of the great actors and actresses over, you know, your career, from Fassbender to Jonah to, Hermi to Hermione, yes. you know, what's one of the most valuable lessons you learned for yourself? I think to just do your thing, honestly. Like, I've noticed no consistency between how these actors work. And as a director... I've noticed actually incredible inconsistencies in what act different actors respond to. Um, and what works with one actor, like some actors I realized solely if I was in the scene with them, they just wouldn't listen to my direction. Like it just, they just wouldn't listen. Just something happened, you know? And I would literally have to tell my partner, like tell him this, like, and other actors, you know, are completely unlike that. And so like, um, you know, when I was I, I when I was in that Steve Jobs movie, I honestly was worried. Like, is is what I do as an actor in any way going to mesh with how this movie is expected to be made? And I instantly found that everyone working on the movie worked completely differently in and of themselves, and that there is no correct way to do it. There's only what makes you feel like you're confident in what you're doing, and so. I guess I don't. I don't know if that's good advice. Is just do you. <laughs> but I think I think that I think when it comes to what makes you feel, I think honestly that okay, longest answer ever. Feeling confident in what you're doing is the most important thing. And whatever makes you feel confident in your performance, whatever you have to do to get to the place. For some actors, it's reading the script a thousand times, knowing every word. For some actors, they like to only kind of know it, and they feel the most confident you know, if they're riding that edge between like barely keeping it together and, and not keeping it together. And so um, I think that whatever makes you feel the most confident on set, because that's the one thing that is bad is when actors start losing confidence in themselves on set. And I've, I've said things to, to in, I've said things to James Franco where you just see, he's like, Oh no. And then he's not funny for like three hours. Cause <laughs> like you see like, Oh, I just like shut him down and I made him not do the crazy shit. That is the shit that makes him so funny. And the reason he's so funny is cause he's like fearless and he'll do anything. And you tell him to do shit. And like, without even thinking he'll do it. And other actors want to have like a fucking 30 minute conversation before you pitch them like one punctuation <laughs> in a line of dialogue, you know? Um, it's funny, we directed this preacher pilot and there's two characters in it who literally don't say a word throughout the entire pilot. We talk to them more than any other actor <laughs> in the entire cast throughout the directing process. <laughs> and that's what they needed to feel confident in their performance. And so me and Evan, it's like babysitting a lot of the time, honestly. <laughs> you you discern what each person needs to to be the best version of, of themselves, I guess, and, and then you just do it. Yeah. 
Coolio, thanks, man. <laughs> hey, Seth. Yo. Uh, you wear different hats, actor, writer, filmmaker. Which one do you like the most and why? Um, I like... They're all... Honestly, I... I I, acting I probably like the least to be totally honest it, it just like is not the most engaging of jobs of all the jobs on set to me you're like kind of not doing shit like 80% of the time and so to me that is very frustrating and I don't like it and so directing on the other hand is probably the most active job you can have on set you're literally doing something 100% of the time you know and I really like that, and I, I like being hyper engaged. I like um, I, directing has probably become the most enjoyable thing to me, um, and writing is also very fun because it's kind of like the most familiar thing, and it's kind of the thing we're always doing amidst all of it as producers is constantly reading other people's scripts and helping with them and having meetings with the writers of those scripts and talking to them about it and 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 at the same time we're generally writing one of our own movies just kind of throughout it all and so but on a day-to-day -day basis directing which we only started doing like you know th four years ago um has been incredibly fun and 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 it's very engaging and so i think right now that is is our favorite thing to do thank you thank you thanks uh hi seth my name is santiago and well you have written like several comedies and well since we were watching food and you know like fruits and vegetables i want to ask you like what do you think is the most important ingredient that a uh, comedy shoot has? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I think it's different things for different people. I, I, I look at, you know, um, I think it's different things for different people. Uh, for us, it's having um, like a very simple emotional story that through all the insanity is very clear and identifiable and articulatable, I don't know if that's a word, by the people who saw the movie afterwards. Like, this movie's insane, obviously, but it's very clearly about something that is like, you know, and, and super bad is, is very similar, and that was where we really learned the lesson, was like, it's really about like two friends who don't know how to say they miss each other or they're going to miss each other basically. And because of that is allows us to like get period blood on one of their legs and do all sorts of crazy <laughs> shit that like would otherwise be appalling were it not surrounding what is like a very sweet emotional center. And so for us, we talk a lot about balance and balancing emotion with you know, crudeness and balancing intelligence with stupidity and balancing, you know, unpredictability with, you know, uh, plausibility and, and just sensibility, you know? Um, and I think balance is the most important thing in making a comedy and, and, and finding the elements that you want to balance and striking that balance again, between, what genres you're trying to mix, which is something we've done in our work before, and finding the exact mix of horror and comedy or action and comedy, or the mix of emotion and comedy, or the mix of intelligence and stupidity, or the mix of relevance and, you know, just kind of mindlessness. I think um, that is the most important thing because that's what makes a movie unpredictable is when you don't know which one of those things it's going to be, but it, it, it's all those things. Thank you. One guy really liked that answer, and I appreciate that. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good answer. I kind of found it on my feet, but uh, by the end, it turned into a pretty good answer. In your six. opinion, yeah. where do you see comedy going as a visual medium in the next 10 years? As a visual medium? What does that mean? Like, like, like in movies? Yeah. Like with a... Uh, Animation and things like that, yeah. I don't know. It's a good question. Um... It's fucking tricky. Like, there's things like, um, there's movies that I've made that I don't think would come out in theaters now. 
Like, I think Super Bad would be really hard to get a theatrical release today. Like, that would probably be sold to Netflix or HB, you know, or, or or some streaming service, you know, because it would probably be deemed that it wasn't eventy enough to merit a theatrical release. And so I think more and more things are going to go in that direction for sure. Um, and I think what this has shown us and what the movies we've done well with shows us, it's that like the things that are like really big swings are the things that seem to work. The things that aren't or things that are like mind bogglingly simple and relatable and like, so like, you can't fucking miss what it's about that it just hits you in the face and just smears itself all over you. You know, like those will always work. It's something that you look at, you know, something that's obvious, I guess. Like neighbors, for example, I would put in that category. It's not a huge concept, but it's a very obvious concept. Anyone gets that if you have a baby, it would suck to live next to a fraternity. Like it's not, a, you know, it doesn't take a lot to wrap your head around that. And then I think there's this is the other category of movies that will continue to succeed in theaters, which is things that are like completely original and without a lot of precedent. And you kind of just have to go see them in theaters because it's so new. And like Deadpool, I think, is a good example of that. And I think um, but I think, for example, like Trainwreck is a good example of the other thing, which is just like a very simple, great, well-executed idea. It's like, what if you flipped a romantic comedy and it's the girl who doesn't want to settle down? Like, it's very, again, it's very clear. Um, and I think things like Superbad, which is not quite clear. It's a high school movie. It's aimed at people who literally can't pay to go see the movie. It's kind of an emotional movie. It's also filthy. It's not really that different from like American Pie, which had come out a few years before it. Um, and so I think that would have faced a lot more hurdles today than it did then. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be harder and harder, I think, to get comedies in movie theaters is the short answer. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, you actually managed to answer my question in a previous Great. response. So, yeah, well done. And uh, I've actually got a favor to ask. My friend Buffy is in the front row there. It's her 21st birthday today. She's Happy been here birthday! Since... Yeah, there we go. Go get drunk. What are you doing here? <laughs> She's been here since 2 p.m. I didn't get her birthday present. I was hoping you could save my ass and give her a hug. Yeah, sure. Come oh on. Oh, my God. Let's do it. Woo! Happy birthday. Uh, only if you want one. I don't want to force myself on you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seth. You are coming here. It's all of a sudden going to be everyone's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, Seth. Uh, my name is Anirat. I'm, Hi. Uh, I'm from uh, the filmmaking department. Awesome. Uh, so I just want to ask you a question about the interview. So uh, how was the experience you had with the interview, the controversy and support the movie received, reshaped and your perception towards filmmaking? Um... I don't know. Um, I don't think it reshaped. If anything, I guess it told me that, you know, uh, if you make a movie about something, then the subject of that something could really react to it <laughs> in a very strong way. And so in a way, I guess it reinforced what I always thought was the power of filmmaking, you know, um, I think it more reinforced ideas that I had, which was, you know, if you antagonize a worthy subject, then that is something that people will probably get behind. And what I didn't predict is that subject perhaps attacking the movie studio that was releasing the film. But honestly, I don't fucking know if North Korea hacked into Sony. I don't even know. That's the weirdest thing is I don't even know what happened. And no one does. And so... Um, <laughs> I think so it's hard to really learn that many lessons from something that you don't even quite know what the fuck happens. <laughs> um, and so I guess one lesson I could have learned was to like tone down what could be considered controversial <laughs> filmmaking. And I clearly did not do that. <laughs> and so um, 
So I guess I didn't learn any lessons. Uh, <laughs> I think as a movie, when I look at it, there are some things story-wise that we could have tightened. And I think honestly, like on a narrative level, there were maybe so there were some filmmaking lessons I learned. Honestly, just it was the second movie we directed, so you just learn a lot from that. So just as a filmmaker, there was a lot I learned just from making my second movie and the kind of things that worked and the things that didn't. Um, but I don't know if I really learned a lot from what happened, because again, I don't really know what happened. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Hey, hey man, how's it going? Good, dude. Uh, so my question was basically answered, but I'm not gonna try and pedal a hug out of you. Okay, you know, I would hug you. Right, <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm huggable. Um, it was basically, you know, with mainstream comedies, budgets kind of going down, do you think you need a big hook like an R-rated comedy yeah. or celebrities playing themselves in order to get it into theaters. I think it helps again. Yeah. Like it, 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 it's, but then I don't, but I have a very, I'm not good at predicting what movies do well and don't like, I look at the movies that are coming out. I see a trailer for a movie and I'm like, Oh, that movie's going to eat shit. And then it's like fucking huge. And so like, <laughs> it's not like I, like, I don't know. Like I would be terrible at running a studio. Like I would have a very bad track record <laughs> as a studio head, you know? And so it's tough because like, I I just don't know, and so we try. That is, those are the only two trends, like I would say, that I that I think exist is like really down the middle, clear ideas that are very well executed, and things that have massive hooks to them. Or put Kevin Hart in it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They're not mutually exclusive, too. You can do all that. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um. So my question is, with it taking ten years to get this going and like it happening um how many changes were made to the original story that you had if any and how many like add-ons and stuff quite a bit changed actually i mean the, the the general idea that there were some things that were the general idea that it was about food that believed that something good happened when they get bought and then found out they get eaten that was always the same um it was always about a hot dog and a bun all that stuff was always the same basically um I think the movie, basically, like, in the last 10 years, we went from being 24 to 34. And so we got a lot smarter in that time. <laughs> and we became much more open-minded about a lot of things. And I think the movie itself was honestly much more overtly anti-faith and anti-religion in its earlier incarnations. And there was a moment at which we realized that that is unnecessarily alienating and not something that internally we even agreed on as the people who were making the movie. And so it took a decidedly more agnostic turn at some point. Again, that kind of was one of the things I was referring to, like when we realized throughout the process that it needed to kind of up its game a little bit. And that's when we finally start to see it for the first time. And we were like, Oh, like, we are smarter than we were when we wrote this version of this movie. And then, and then we realized just like a lot of the ideas about acceptance and looking past each other's differences. We just, again, as we got older, we got better at articulating those ideas and they became more clear to us as people. And so they became easier to put in the movie. And I think there were many versions of the, like we did test versions of this movie with like literally hand drawn animation, like several years ago that were fucking really bad at times like way off like things happened not just like as far as like the sensitivity of balancing kind of the various uh you know waves different races or ethnicities or religions are portrayed just like some shit was fucking disgusting and you didn't want to look <laughs> at it and so all that took years of calibration and i think as we got older a big part of it was was acknowledging that we were aging and getting smarter throughout the process and not trying to hold on to these ideas that were at one point very important to the movie. And then, you know, again, we would look at them and be like, we don't even believe this stuff anymore. Like at one point I was like, fuck everyone who believes everything. And then I'm just like, eh, hey, whatever. Who the fuck knows? You know, <laughs> like, I could be wrong. Who knows? And so, you know, that, that's just, again, I think something that happened as we got older and mellowed a little bit with age. And I think it made the movie much better and much smarter and much more inclusive, which I think 
was always the goal of the whole movie was to be about inclusion and looking past each other's differences and that that isn't what we were doing as as the filmmakers in a lot of ways thank you so much thank you hi seth hi um great movie by the way thank I you so it. much um dolly Wadiba is my name as a young actor starting off in hollywood did you ever feel like you were not talented enough or not smart enough or not special enough? And if you did, at what point did you stop feeling that way? Um, I mean, I was very lucky in that I got on a TV show very young, but then I went years without working. And I did for sure start to think that like Freaks and Geeks was like an anomaly. And I was only cast because I was a fucking weird looking Canadian guy. <laughs> and, and once that was over, no one would ever want to put me in anything again, basically. Um, and that wasn't that far from the truth, honestly. It, it really, um, basically, you know, Undeclared was canceled in like 2001. And I didn't act again, basically, until 40-Year-Old Virgin, which came out in 2005. And so there was basically like four years where I did absolutely nothing, you know? Um, I had a good Mexican weed hookup. That was helpful. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, it was, <laughs> but I I did very little, and it was really during that time that I definitively learned that if I wanted to have a career as an actor, I first had to get a career as a writer and a producer, and then I had to cast myself as an actor, essentially, which is basically what I did. Like. The only reason I was cast in Knocked Up is because I had been working with Judd as a writer and I'd been helping him rewrite his movies. So I was just like a guy who was around him, you know? And on 40 Year Old Virgin, I was cast in that because I was a producer on it first and I was helping rewrite it on set and write jokes and stuff like that. And so, you know, and then the movies we wrote, we wrote for myself to star in. There was probably better people we could have gotten, honestly, but, uh, but it just seemed again, like it, it was the only way to perpetuate my career as an actor was to provide myself with that work. And if I didn't do that, I would have acted in like two fucking movies in the last decade, literally. Like I would have been in the Steve Jobs movie and like, and that's it. Like it, it would, and I wouldn't have been in that cause no one would know who I was cause I would have been in the nine previous movies, you know? Um, so I did not think there was like a room full of Hollywood people being like, you know, what we need is like a stone Jewish Canadian guy. Like, <laughs> like I just, I just knew that that conversation wasn't happening. And so I had to be the one creating the material that required a stoned Jewish Canadian guy. <laughs> and, and I, and I knew that was my only way to do it basically. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can't do it, become friends with someone who needs a so Jewish Canadian guy. Implore them to write a role for, for you. Uh, hi, Seth. Hi. Uh, my name is Amelia. I'm in the acting department here. Uh, great movie. I Thank agree. You. It's really good. I laughed a lot. <laughs> um, I'm curious. My, my question is pretty basic, but which is the movie you most enjoyed, I mean, making as an actor? Uh, it's really tough. Probably, honestly, I think, like... They're different. Like, Superbad was fun because it was, like, the movie we wrote all throughout high school. But This is the End was probably the most fun because it was, like, all of my best friends who are actors. And, like, we literally were stuck in a house together, essentially. And we filmed it in New Orleans, which is one of the best cities in the world. And so it was – it felt very special. And those scenes when we were filming, like, the big party and, like, like literally, like – the whole cast of Superbad was in the scene and me and Jason Siegel and James Franco from Freaks and Geeks were in a scene together and, you know, and people, Kevin Hart, who I've known for like 15 years but had never worked with, was in the scene and Rihanna, who I'd never fucking met, was in the scene. <laughs> and so it was, there was this sense of like, this is amazing and it will never happen again probably. And so that was something that we even just, as we were filming, like we would all just be sitting around being like, this is so nice and it will probably never happen again. Like the odds of getting all of us in the same place at the same time. It's a miracle it happened on that movie, honestly, and it will probably never happen again. <laughs> so, so that was, that felt special. And it was so weird because we were all playing ourselves. So there was also like a very surreal element to it. Um, it, it was very meta. It, it was very, uh, it was a very strange experience for everybody. I think, yeah. 
Yeah, I thought that was your answer. <laughs> Thank <Yeah. you. laughs> Especially when you knew the end of the world is coming. Exactly, yeah. It makes it super fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> you got the Pineapple Express shirt. I do, yeah. Nice. Showing some sport. Yes. Uh, my question is actually in regards to uh, this is the end as well. Um, what influenced you in giving your real life best friends the traits you gave them in that script? <laughs> Some of it's based on reality. <laughs> and some of it is completely fiction. Um, like, the... <laughs> Me and Jay have been friends for a very long time, and it is true that as I became closer friends with Franco and Joan and them, he... Me and him grew a little further apart over the years, and we just wrote that into the movie. And I'll never forget, we sent it to Jay, and he wrote it. He was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> He's like, "You're putting that in the movie?" I was like, "Yeah, we're just putting that in the movie. Like that's what it's about." And so, um, but I'm still friends with Jay, so it all. And I'm friends with all of them in the end, so it all. That's why we felt comfortable doing it. Um, but so it was a combination of their. For some people, for Franco, obviously, he's known for being a weird artist guy, and so, and he's known for maybe kind of being in love with me, and so that was <laughs> like heavily inspired that. Jonah's was actually completely his idea. He, we actually had a completely different version of Jonah's character, and he was the one who was like, it'll be funny if I'm one of those guys who like, you think is who like seems like he's being nice to you the whole time, but you think he is actually probably fucking with you the whole time, and and he did it so well. And um, and Danny again, Danny played like right into what you would perceive him to be, but then like Michael Sarah is exactly the opposite of what you would perceive him to be, and so um, it really was again like a balance, like I was saying, of kind of giving the audience what they expected and at the same time subverting their expectations. So it was surprising. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how you doing, Seth? I'm good, man. Uh, my name is uh, Brock Berman. Cool. Uh, first off, I just wanted to say I love listening to you on, on Howard Stern's show. Cool. A lot. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, my question is... It's a lot like this, probably. Yeah, right? yeah it's great. <laughs> it's just me talking. <laughs> Uh, my question for you is, I'm probably one of the youngest ones here. I'm only 17, but nice. I'm starting here soon. Um, my question is, when you were my age, what did you do? What what advice would you have for someone that's just really starting out in the, the industry? Um, I really... Uh you know, I'm not a competitive person, and I and and what sucks is Hollywood's very competitive, <laughs> and so I really had to. Um, there was a few things. I I I really had to be able to tell myself that I was working harder than everyone who was trying to get the same jobs I was trying to get. And I was trying to be a writer. I was trying to be a producer. I was trying to be an actor. As an actor, you can't do shit. You're fucked. So basically, what, what you can do is try to act in as many things as humanly possible. Or again, literally try to become friends with people who are making their own things and try to convince them to put you in those things, you know. Um, but that was one of the things was to really try to just work as to show that I had like an unmatched work ethic that if, if that I would just work as hard as anyone was ever going to work on anything. The other thing, cause I was very young. I tried to never play that card in any way, shape or form. But at the same time, I tried to be very honest about it because as a young person, you have a perspective that no one who's older has. And you're actually like living the things that people are like, reflecting on later in their lives and you know when i did stand-up comedy i was actually very like reluctant to talk about my age at first because i didn't want it to be viewed as like a gimmick i didn't want to be like known as like the 15 year old comedian so i would tell jokes that were like seinfeld desk like kind of observational humor like what's the deal with crazy glue what's so crazy about it you know like um <laughs> And then I remember another comic pulled me aside and was like, dude, like you're fucking 16 years old. Like you're trying to get a hand job for the first time right now. <laughs> like, that is like a remarkable perspective to have comedically as a writer, as an actor, whatever you're trying to do. That is like a remarkable perspective to have. And you shouldn't deny that. And so that was like a very interesting lesson for me was to accept my age and not deny it, but at the same time to never try to 
use my age as like a gimmick and be like the young comedian, you know, that always like, I hated that idea. And so it was again, finding the balance between and writing super bad was really that like finding the balance between doing work that I thought was adult and, you know, transcended the fact that I was a teenager, but at the same time, do work that could only be done by a teenager and offer a perspective that you could only have if you were in high school. And literally, like, Superbad was on TV the other day, and I haven't watched it in, like, a fucking decade, and I was watching it, and I was like, I could never write this movie today because I'm too old, and I don't know what the fuck kids do in high school. I'm terrified of high school kids. You scare me. I don't know what's like. <laughs> and so... Um, it, it really, uh, so I think that is just something that I thought a lot about when I was younger is how do I use my age and at the same time, not use my age because people will just always hate the guy who seems like he's using his age, but you just aren't using all your tools. If you are not using your perspective, which is entirely based on your age. And so I guess that's my advice, if it makes any fucking sense whatsoever. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thank you. Last question lurking in the shadows, my man. No microphone adjustments. Okay. okay I'll just <laughs> um, hey, so my home. name is Damon. Yeah. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Edward Norton. So oh, yeah, he's great. I kind of wanted to know how he became a part of this project. And then also, in general, when it comes to trying to get somebody a part of your project that you don't work with all the time, like how do you go about approaching them? Yeah. Edward um, is, you would never think it. I've known Edward personally for like 10 years just through other people. And so we've actually been very good friends. Um, I think I literally met him on the set of, of Knocked Up or Super Bad for the first time because he was friends with one of the producers of that. And, and we've actually been good friends ever since then. And literally, like, he was one of the first people we just casually told this idea to and he was like I he became obsessed with it and he was like I have to be in it I want to be in it just please let me be in it and he's the only reason Salma Hayek is in it because uh, they know each other from Frida and um, we I'd never met Salma Hayek in my life and he was friends with her and he was like she has to play the taco I know her she'll get it <laughs> and and um, and he convinced Salma Hayek to do it. And he was really been like one of the biggest cheerleaders of the movie, um, which is so weird because you just wouldn't expect it of him. But he actually is like a very funny guy. And, you know, in his personal life and just his work rarely reflects that. Um, but uh and I guess as far as getting people in your work, I mean, the Edward Norton thing is kind of a good uh, representation. Just, like, do whatever you can. Like, ask anyone who you think can get to the person that you're trying to get to and, you know, just really try – just put yourself out there and be very honest. Like, I think that's a key is to not misrepresent what it is you want them to do, like, especially for us because we want people to do really crazy shit a lot of the time. I recently found the email I sent to Channing Tatum when I asked him to be the gimp and this is the end. And <laughs> what I was amazed by was how, like – plain it was <laughs> like I because I, I was very concerned that he would show up and and not and and in some way be expecting something different so I was literally like this is the movie you are playing Danny McBride sexual gimp it will require you to be at the end of a leash uh he talks about butt fucking you he throws animal crackers <laughs> at you he yanks you around he talks about how you're his bitch how you're an idiot like like I was just like if you have a problem with any of this just don't do it but like because because that's like the nightmare is if they show up and they're like 99 percent on board yeah. and then then that 1% is like a fucking real chasm to navigate at times. And so, yeah, and, and I get very nervous around actors, honestly. Like, I don't like, like, as a director, like, talking to actors is, like, by far my least favorite thing to do. Like, I don't like dealing with actors. I make Evan talk to the actors a lot of the time because I just, I get nervous. I'm like, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Like, I just don't. I just don't like talking to them. And so even if I'm friends with them, I don't like talking to them. I'm more comfortable talking to them if I'm friends with them, which is probably a reason I work with my friends so much because I'm for sure more comfortable talking to my friends. But like when you have to like tell, like give like Eminem direction, like it's fucking horrifying. And, 
And again, the only reason, the only thing that makes it slightly less horrifying is because I've made it incredibly clear what I was going or the types of things I was going to ask him to do before he showed up that day. And like the only reason you can ask Salma Hayek in a small recording booth to like act as though a turnip is shoving its root in her throat is because you've had very explicit conversations over the types of things the movie is going to entail and you've given them every fathomable way out that you could give someone because again, like I would so much rather have an, my second choice who's 100% committed than my first choice who's 99.9% .9 committed because the last thing you need is on set like or in a recording booth or anywhere like having to navigate a sudden difference in sensibilities or a, a lack of understanding over what the movie or TV show or whatever it was was going to entail like Again, we've been in those situations. It's why whenever we need anyone to do any nudity in one of our movies, we hire porn stars. Because we're like, this is the easiest thing they've been asked to do this week. <laughs> <laughs> There's not going to be any, like, really? They're just like, yeah, fucking go. Like, you're not shoving anything in me? I'm good. And so, like, <laughs> that is, that's kind of, like, the philosophy for, for everything is, like, you don't want to have to be convincing people to do things on set. You want them to be psyched on set. You want that to be the most joyous experience for everyone possible. And, you know, that's when everything is hypothetical when you're filming the movie. It's not until you're editing it that you actually have to deal with all the shit that happened. Like, set, there's, like, no reason to ever be unhappy. It should only be a pleasant, creative you know, experience where you're just getting as much as you humanly can that you think you might need. And the only way to do that, again, is if everyone is fully trusting and fully on board. And the only way to do that is if you've really gone out of your way to explain to them that, like, you know, they're going to be shoved in some food products that, you know, you don't want them surprised at the premiere. Uh, so, um, yeah, so be be honest, I guess, is 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 the thing to do. All right, thanks for coming out, man. Thank you. So as you can see, just as in his movies, he comes here and he's 100% giving you a joyous experience. <laughs> and he could have been at home counting the grosses, but instead he came here. <laughs> just dollar by dollar, yeah. yes. <laughs> instead I have a ticker in my house that just keeps <laughs> Instead, he came here to uh, help you out. And I think that it's only fair if all of us got on social media and told everybody how fabulous the That's movie fine. is. If I have one, I, I, I would say one more thing. And that is like, if this movie shows any, like, this movie was our craziest idea. And most people who we told this idea to looked at us like we were fucking idiots. <laughs> and like, we were, like, like, it was, like, it was dumb. And like, it wouldn't work. And... And and our best movies are always the ideas that are the craziest ones. And if I look, at, if I see like a lack of one thing in movies, it's I don't see a ton of people making stuff where you're just like, what the fuck? Like, how did they do that? And that is like all I ever want to go see in movie theaters is movies where like I'm literally wondering how it got made, you know? Those are like, as a kid, the best experiences I had. I remember seeing Pulp Fiction in a theater and just being like, what the fuck? Like, like it was, it blew my mind. And so I think like if, if I hope any of you take anything from this is that I'm sitting in a movie theater in a few years watching a movie where I'm thinking like how the fuck did people make this please make those movies make movies that people are like how did they do it <laughs>